So, is religion the opium of the people? And what does it mean after all? Hi, this is Religiolog, and in this video I'd like to discuss the views of Karl Marx on religion. And since in my argumentation I heavily rely on Daniel Pulse's wonderful book Nine Theories of Religion, published by Oxford in 2015, I'll follow Pulse's advice and try to maintain a neutral position in my examination of Marx. From the start I should say that I never been a fan of Marx, but I also haven't been his fervent critic, so I hope I'll be able to maintain some neutrality. At the same time I must admit that I was born in the Soviet Union and grew up mainly after its collapse, when streets and parks named after Marx were renamed, and monuments of Marx and Lenin were dismantled. So, I grew up in the environment where anything associated with Marx was generally viewed in a negative light. Please keep this in mind as we move on. Here is what we are going to do in this review. First, I'll talk a bit about Marx and his life. After that, I'll tell you what Marx generally thinks about history and society and how religion fits into this worldview. What it does and what Marx thinks we should do about it. Then I briefly discuss how his ideas were implemented in the Soviet Union. And only towards the end we'll discuss what critics say about the Marxist approach to religion. For your convenience, time codes are in the description. First, it is important to understand that of all the prominent classical theorists of religion, Marx is the earliest. Let me remind you that on my channel I already reviewed such classics as Durkheim, Freud, James and partially Weber, but ideas of Marx appeared long before them and they influenced them. Some of them, for example Weber, even enter into polemics with Marx and try to refute his theses. Unlike Marx, Weber thought that cultural, religious and ethical factors also play a role in shaping economic behavior and the development of capitalism. In short, this is what Marx thought about religion. In his opinion, religion is a pure illusion. More than that, it is an illusion that has very bad consequences. After all, it replaces reality and justifies the status quo in which disadvantaged people accept their suffering and poverty as something natural and they don't fight for their happiness. They agree to suffer here in the hope that they will be rewarded in the afterlife. Marx was also sure that all religions determined by economics. Economics is the basis. So it makes no sense to study various religious doctrines or beliefs. After all, the essence of all religions is the same. So why bother yourself with anthropology or psychology of religion? I'll also add that just as many would claim that Freud did not just present us with a theory of religion, but through psychoanalysis he granted us with an entire system of thought that simply resembles a religion as part of it. Exactly the same could be said about Marx, but his ideas or system of thought had a way larger impact on our world. After all, his ideas were the ruling philosophy of governments in many parts of the world. As some researchers notice, Marx's writings are as sacred to some communists as is the Bible to the most sincere and devout Christians. After all, communism offers a system of doctrines. It has its own ceremonies, sacred places and sacred persons. It has missionaries who in the space of one century have won and now of course lost millions of converts. They also remind us that communist governments have carried out persecutions more fearsome even than those of the Middle Ages or wars of religion. Communism in essence claims to present not just a broad theory of politics, society and economics, but a compelling total vision of human life, complete with a philosophical stance on humanity's place in the natural world. It explains all that is past in history and gives a prophecy of what is still to come. So please keep this in mind as we move on. Also keep in mind that in his philosophy and multiple volumes of text, Marx never presented us with a clear, somewhat systematic theory of religion. He just left us some general comments on religion. So who was Karl Marx? He was born in 1818 in modern Germany in family of Jewish lawyer. Grandfathers on both sides were rabbis 
but because of Prussia's anti-Jewish law, his father eventually converted to Christianity. In 1841, Marx completed a doctoral dissertation devoted to two ancient Greek philosophers, Democritus and Epicurus. Both of them were materialists, and their ideas would eventually influence Marx's thinking. Marx would be convinced that, firstly, it is economic conditions that determine human behavior, and secondly, that human history is the history of class struggle. It is the scene of a perpetual conflict between those who own things, the rich, and those who must work to survive. That is the battle of rich and poor. That's why some people even call Marxist ideology the ideology of poor people, the working class who want to break free from being treated unfairly by the rich. And if economics is the base, then such things as politics, laws, ethics, art, literature, religion, and others are the superstructure. In Marxist philosophy, the distribution of labor plays a very important role. Therefore, if you want to understand religion, politics, or even family, you first need to understand material reality. Uh, Marx believed that throughout history, economic facts have formed the foundation of social life. They are the base that generates the division of labor, the struggle of classes, and human alienation. And things like religion, that belong to the superstructure, not only arise from the economic base, but are also largely shaped by it. And they are a reflection of the class struggle. The institutions we normally associate with cultural life, uh, like uh, family, government, the arts, most of philosophy, ethics, and religion, must be understood as structures whose main role is to provide control over the working masses and to suppress their hostility so that they do not rebel against those in power. Therefore, in the past, there have always been ethical leaders, theologians, philosophers, and moralists who help to control the poor simply by preaching to them or by telling them what is right and what is wrong. And according to Marx, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. In the Middle Ages, for instance, when farming was the chief means of production, all lands were owned by bishops of the church or by feudal lords, who defended their property with armies of vassals. And no surprise that the moral code of the day stressed devotion to the church and warrior virtues, such as obedience, honor, and loyalty to feudal master. In other words, uh, philosophers and theologians will promote those moral values that serve the economic system of the time. Of course, they will claim that these are some universal, eternal truths, that their ideal of morality corresponds to the order of the universe itself, and it simply can't be any other way. Uh, at the same time, they are conditional and in fact determined by the economic realities of their particular place and time. According to Marx, even writers and artists only create the illusion of protest. In fact, they unconsciously and silently approve of the society under the oppressor's control. That is, even intellectuals will always serve the rulers. Apparently, they seem to promote individualism and originality or create ideas and works of art which in their mind seem to arise from a desire for truth or love of beauty, but in reality, they simply express the interests of the upper class and justify things as they stand. Marx also believed that it is capitalism that leads the rising middle class to adopt a new form of religion in Europe, that is, Protestantism. Uh, why? Because Protestantism is much better suited to its interest in trade, investment, and individual enterprise. That is, according to Marx, in each case we can see that the superstructure of politics and religion is really controlled by the economic base and the dynamics of class struggle. Now, let's finally talk in more detail about religion. As we've noticed, for Marx, religion is a pure illusion that is also extremely harmful. Its goal is to justify the status quo because it teaches you to come to terms with uh, what you have and not to rebel, but to follow the rules of the game that are beneficial to the current elite. This way, religion helps to ensure control over society. 
Moreover, according to Marx, religion is so much determined by economics that there is no point for us to think of the differences between the doctrines or beliefs of various religions. They all serve the same functions. Belief in God or gods is a sad byproduct of class struggle and should be rejected with contempt. In fact, probably none of the classical theorists of religion, not even Freud, felt as much contempt for religion as Marx. He was disgusted to see how many people voluntarily humiliated themselves, called themselves miserable sinners, and instead of being proud of their achievements, they gave all the praise and glory to the gods. Marx couldn't understand why people do this at all. Instead of being proud that we came out of the jungles and advanced to the point that we create machines and railroads, why do we humiliate ourselves like that? Marx himself was inspired by the ideas of Feuerbach, but Feuerbach simply admitted such problems, like, well, what can you do? It's just the way people are, they are weak. But Marx wasn't satisfied with this. He wanted to explain exactly why people are unhappy with themselves yet pleased with some gods that are so good and perfect. He observes that there is a parallel between religious and socioeconomic activity. Both are marked by alienation. Religion takes moral ideals out of our natural human life and unnaturally gives them to an imaginary and alien being we call God. And Marx draws a parallel with capitalism where people just as readily deliver their labor for nothing more than wages to get other things that money will buy. And as the religion robs us of our human merits and gives them to God, so the capitalist economy robs us of our labor, our true self-expression, and gives it as a mere commodity in the hands of those, the rich, who are able to buy it. Remember the famous words of Marx. Religious distress is at the same time the expression of real economic distress. And the protest against real distress, religion, is the sight of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, just as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusionary happiness of the people is required for their real happiness. The demand to give up the illusion about its condition is the demand to give up a condition which needs illusions. That is, by generating fantasies, religion eases the pain in people's life. And this, according to Marx, is precisely the role of religion in the life of the poor. Thanks to religious fantasies of an afterlife where all sorrow ceases and all oppression disappears, believers numb the pain of cruel exploitation in this world. To Marx, being religious is no different from being addicted to a drug like opium. It is this immersion in an imaginary world that makes religion a comforter of pain what basically was the role of opium in those days. It is pure escapism. Escape from a cruel, unjust reality is the main function that religion offers to the oppressed. But what's worse for Marx? Religion is extremely destructive. After all, if the poor are happy with the thought of the next life, then they will not rebel against oppression in this life. This way injustice becomes a normal part of life, just surrender yourself and the reward will come later. But what distinguished Marx from others was his passionate demand for action. He wanted change here and now. He wasn't interested in tons of theoretical thinkers who just talk about religion philosophically. You can't just claim that the problem exists. We must find a strategy to fix the problem. After all, the situation needs to change, the world needs to be fixed. At the same time, rich people or oppressors also need religion because it provides them with an ideology. It reminds both the poor and the rich of the will of God and that poor must obey their master because all power comes from God. That is, politicians and monarchs can use religion to justify their holy power or a holy war. Religion offers them a divine justification for the status quo. Therefore, whether you are rich or poor, that's your destiny, your place in divine providence, and the social structure must be preserved as it is. After all, this is the will of heaven. 
Marx also recalled that Christianity justified the slavery of antiquity, glorified the serfdom of the Middle Ages, and defended the oppression of the proletariat. Also, the social principle of Christianity preached the necessity of a ruling and an oppressed class. Marx wrote, the social principles of Christianity preach cowardness, self-contempt, abasement, submission, dejection. Uh, therefore, I repeat that for Marx, faith in God or in heavenly salvation is not just an illusion. It is an illusion that imprisons people. It paralyzes the workers because instead of directing their energy to organizing an uprising against unjust oppression, they become immersed in fantasy. Religion imprisons. It promotes oppression by presenting a system of belief that declares poverty and misery to be unavoidable facts of life. But as we know, in history there have been manifestations of religious communism or forms of Marxism that sympathize with religion when religious people applied Marxist ideas and didn't really see a contradiction in this. As I've mentioned in these videos, even in the USSR there were such ideologists. Engels, for example, and the later Marxist historian Karl Kautsky in his Foundations of Christianity both suggested that communism could be the friend of religion, but not just its enemy. After all, if you think about it, the rise of Christianity in the ancient world could be seen as the expression of a proletarian revolutionary protest against privileged Roman oppressors. Possibly many of you remember that in the 20th century theologians in Latin America also have drawn on Marxist analysis to frame the protest against economic injustice. We know it as liberation theology. That is, it's not something impossible when religious people are sympathetic with communism. And indeed, no matter how much Marx hated religion, he didn't try to make religion into communism's great public enemy. Uh, because in his worldview, religion actually doesn't matter much. Yes, it certainly helps the oppressor, yet there is no need to launch hysterical crusades against it. Because it's not that important. After all, for Marx, religion is just a symptom of a disease and not the disease itself. It belongs to the superstructure of society, not to its base, and the real battlefield for the oppressed should be the base. As Marx wrote, the call to abandon their illusions about their condition is a call to abandon a condition which requires illusions. That is, the poor will rely on religion until the issue of their poverty is resolved. Marx was fully confident that when this happened, religion, like the state and everything else in the superstructure of oppression, would wither away on its own. As I mentioned in this review, in her book about the history of the Soviet atheism, Victoria Smolkin explains that if Marx and Lenin wrote little about religion, they wrote even less about atheism, largely because they considered it unimportant to the revolutionary unfolding of history. For both Marx and Lenin, religion had no autonomous power, since it was part of the superstructure. Its existence depended on the economic and political base that nurtured it. Without the capitalist foundation and religious institutions that exploited the masses in its service, religion would simply disappear along with private property, class divisions, the family and the entire bourgeois capitalist edifice. When a Chicago Tribune reporter asked Marx in 1879 whether he and his followers would like to see religion destroyed root and branch, Marx replied, we know that violent measures against religion are nonsense. But this is an opinion. As socialism grows, religion will disappear. That is, when the communism is built, then thoughts about the mystical heaven will die out on their own. As Joseph Blankholm states in his article, Marx recognized the emotional need for religion. He thought that religion never warrants the full frontal assault because it is a symptom rather than a cause. It also means that the masses will be able to accept atheism only if the socio-economic roots of the conditions that force them to believe in religion are removed. Religion should die out naturally and gradually in the course of the implementation of the ideas of socialism. This way, atheism did not produce communism. Vice versa, atheism was the product of communism.
And now, after we've tried to understand Marx's attitude towards religion, let's analyze it. Daniel Pulse suggests to focus on two elements. First, that Marx takes a functional and rather simplified approach to religion, that is reductionism, and the second is that he connects religion with economics. And after briefly explaining them, I would analyze an attempt to implement Marx's ideas in the Soviet Union. Let's begin with the first one. Marx's general approach to religion is similar in form to the functional explanations we've observed in both Freud and Durkheim. If you haven't seen my video reviews on Freudian and Durkheimian theories of religion, please do so. The links are in the description. So, uh, Marx is interested uh, not so much in the content of religious beliefs, not so much in what people actually say is true about God, heaven or the Bible, but in the role that these beliefs play in the social struggle. That is, just like Freud and Durkheim, Marx also tried to find the magic key to religion. He wanted to understand its function. He wants to figure out why people believe in silly superstitions and what they get from it. Hopefully you remember that for Freud, psychological functionalism was the cornerstone of his theory. For Durkheim, it was sociological functionalism. But for Marx, it is unjust economic condition of society that makes people to be religious. And on the one hand, Marx's emphasis on society makes his view closer to Durkheim uh, than to Freud, because Freud's emphasis was mainly on the individual and not on the group of people. At the same time, Marx and Freud are closer to each other on the other side of the problem. Remember, for Durkheim, religion is in a very real sense simply the worship of society, he thinks it impossible to imagine human social life without some set of either religious rituals or their equivalent. That is, according to Durkheim, we people will always need some form of religion. To understand it better, please watch my review on the channel. But Marx and Freud, by contrast, reject such approach. They both think religion expresses a false need for comfort and security and they are perfectly happy to predict the disappearance of religion. In other words, they really believe that in the future it will be possible to create a world without any religion. All we need to do is to understand the cause and function of religious fantasies and satisfy them through something non-religious. But look at the difference between Marx and Freud. Yes, Freud thinks people would be much better off without the neurotic illusion of faith, but he seems to realize many will still cling to them. According to Freud, it's still acceptable for some groups of people to be religious, but Marx goes further. He thinks that people will not get better until they get rid of religious illusions completely. Religion is absolute evil that must be destroyed, because it endorses a social order that is deeply unjust. But before that, of course, the revolution must destroy the exploitation and misery that have created religion in the first place. Now, the next element in Marx's approach is how religion relates to economics. Marx thought that it's impossible to understand religious life anywhere without exploring its close ties to economics and social realities. No matter what we look at, the Protestant Reformation, the English Civil War, the French Revolution, colonialism or slavery, we always need to pay attention to the material side of the situation, to the economy. After all, the material conditions of existence determine human consciousness and not vice versa. And now let's analyze what happened to Marxist ideas when they were put into practice in the Soviet Union. Those of you who watched my reviews on the history of Soviet atheism probably remember how the Soviet government thought religion with administrative measures and how under Stalin they subordinated religious institutions to the government apparatus. Religion was considered virtually neutralized as an autonomous political agent, and in theory it should no longer influence Soviet society. They destroyed almost all churches, mosques and synagogues, but Marxist ideological model and predictions about the future of religion did not come true. Administrative restrictions didn't lead to the inevitable disappearance of faith. They realized that religion is not something static, it always keeps transforming and modernizing. 
conventional Marxist idea that religion is something atavistic, medieval, and incapable of modernization proved to be wrong. As it turned out later, religion in the Soviet Union was much more widespread and persistent than Marx predicted. Soviet people were full of superstitions, scientific progress and scientific education never destroyed religion, and research by Soviet scientists revealed some ideological blind spots of Marxism-Leninism. According to the pattern of development outlined by Marxism-Leninism, religion supposed to disappear under the pressure of socialist construction and scientific progress, but it didn't happen. So it wasn't enough to simply take and eliminate the administrative, political and economic basis of religion. Soviet atheists misunderstood and underestimated religion. Their ordinary explanations no longer worked, such as poverty, social inequality, or that religion is a product of ignorance and backwardness. All these couldn't explain the complex spiritual landscape of the Soviet Union. In the 70s and 80s, it became clearer that both the common people and the creative intelligentsia refused to participate in the atheistic project of the Soviet Union. On the contrary, they showed interest in religious heritage and spiritual issues. As a result, the party abandoned atheism and in general a monopoly on truth. When they tried to apply Marxist ideas in practice, they didn't stand up to practice. And what is really important, even without a capitalist foundation and religious institutions that exploit the masses, religion continued to grow. Well, now let's try to take a critical look at these views of Marx. Where do scholars see flaws in Marx's approach to religion? Firstly, what Marx actually presents is not an account of religion in general, but an analysis of Christianity and of similar faiths that stresses belief in God and afterlife. Perhaps he was influenced here by Hegel, who saw Christianity as the highest form of religion and felt that whatever he said about Christianity applied automatically to all other religions as well. Feuerbach also took a similar position and Marx followed analysis of Feuerbach, but what is also important is that Marx focuses not so much on world civilization as the culture and economy of Western Europe, where Christianity essentially developed. It's mainly Christianity that Marx has in mind when he depicts religion as an opium-like escape for the poor from economic misery and oppression. And yes, if you really try, this model can be applied to some teachings of Hinduism or Buddhism, Although Eastern religions often offer different functions and visions uh, if we compare them to Western religions. Uh, but also, what about many primitive tribal religions? Some of them have almost no meaningful doctrine of afterlife. Or what about religions of ancient Greece and Rome? After all, they offered hope of an afterlife on terms just the opposite of Marxist. Immortality for the great and powerful and the mere shadow existence for a simple folk. Also, according to Marx, the phenomenon of alienation, which creates religion, came about only as human societies were introduced to the division of labor and private property. And what does it mean? That there was a time in history of mankind when people did not need religion, and in fact did not have it. And maybe in some deep prehistoric age this was true, but we don't have historical evidence to support such an idea. Nor do we see any evidence that modern tribal peoples are devoid of religion or that they are less inclined to it than others. But according to Marx, their way of life is closest to the idea of an original communism. As you may see, the problem is quite serious. But now let's move on to the next problem. Whether Christian or not, religion in Marx's view is an ideology. Uh, like the state or arts, religion also belongs to the superstructure of society, and in a fundamental way it depends on the economic base. Uh, what does it mean? That if there is a change in economic life, a change in religion must follow. The problem with this position is that Marx explains it in very broad terms, and they could be interpreted ambiguously. On one hand, Marx insists that his own research is strictly scientific in nature, but when he reduces religion to economics and the class struggle, he does so in terms so broad that his hypotheses are very difficult to test in any systematic scientific fashion. 
let's say we agree with Marx's view that the rise of capitalism at the end of the Middle Ages caused a shift away from Catholicism and toward Protestantism. But then what about more specific small-scale changes? Does the religious superstructure change with them as well? In some religions of Europe, we actually find evidence of capitalism even in the medieval period. But why then there wasn't any changes of the Protestant type in the social superstructure? Plus, after the emergence of capitalism, some cities and countries did not become Protestant. How can this be? And even in those countries where Protestantism actually arose, can we be sure that it was economics that changed the religion? What if it was the other way around, as Marx Weber claimed? What if it was a new religion that changed the economy? There are multiple cases in which ideas from spheres of art, literature and morals, as well as from politics and law, have changed or shaped economics in important ways, but Marx suggested exactly the opposite. If you are interested, please watch this video on my channel, where I share why some researchers think it is Orthodox Christianity that holds the economic development in Eastern Europe, or that it created the foundation for the popularity of communism in that region. In this review, I also mentioned the amazing book by economists Asimoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, The Regions of Power, Prosperity and Poverty. Its authors enter into an indirect polemical dispute with the authors of other theories that try to explain global inequality. Among them, they are critiquing the geographical theory, the theory of ignorance of the elites, and what is relevant to our topic, the culture theory, or the theory of Max Weber about the influence of Protestant ethics on economic development. In their opinion, things like geography, climate, culture, religion, race, or the ignorance of political leaders are either insufficient or defective in explaining the gap between rich and poor regions. They also discuss the failure of various communist regimes to implement theoretical ideas of Marx into practice. Authors conclude that the global inequality mainly has to do with a defining role of institutions. The economic prosperity depends above all on the inclusiveness of economic and political institutions. Here is a quote from them, in case you are interested, and I highly recommend this book. But let's return to Marx. And here the conclusion is that uh, many scholars continue to criticize Marx for the fact that cultural interactions are too complex to reduce everything to one element. I mean that economy must always be the cause while all other elements are simply effects. That is, Marx's hypothesis is very simplified. After all, religion fits into the fabric of society as part of a complex network of causes and effects and they constantly influence each other in complicated ways. And let's put the rest of the world aside, take just the history of the development of Western civilization, and we'll see that even here Marx's formula doesn't work. Now let's focus a bit on Marx's political theory. And here we see that at the heart of Marx's social theory, there is a basic conflict or paradox that some scholars describe as the problem of totalitarian democracy. For Marx, religion is reduced to economics. So it's important for us to understand his general theory of economics and society and see whether it works or not. Uh, for example, Marx insists that the working class or the proletariat is the great agent of the revolution. It must rise up to destroy oppressive capitalism. But what happens next? The leaders of such a revolution will embody the common interests of the people. And such collective will of the people must be united. There is no room for disagreement regarding its goals. There should always be only one political party. There can be no such thing as individual freedom for artists, scientists and intellectuals, because they all must serve a single goal, the will of the proletariat. But if so, then it's very hard to see how it could ever achieve the end of a perfectly classless, uh, harmonious community. Marx seems to assume that the workers, in all of their millions will, or any important social issue, have only one point of view. But why should this necessarily be so? During World War, some communists expected that proletarians in each of the European nations would unite and won't fight with each other. But that didn't happen. Even for communists, national interests, language and culture turned out to be stronger than class solidarity. They thought for country, not class. 
Uh, secondly, and more importantly, uh, Marxist theory assumes that a group, an elite of proletarian leaders, will actually make important decisions on behalf of the workers. But all this will be without any institution in the society that has a right to examine or question that claim. If I, as communist party leader, speak on behalf of the party and someone dares to object me, will they immediately become enemies of the revolution? To this, party leaders should not necessarily respond with convincing arguments, but with force. That's why we often see in history of states ruled by the Communist Party the suppression of basic human rights, and in fact dictatorship. Under such a regime, the working class itself is in danger. It turns out that there is no ideological competition, and power determines morality. And finally, a few words about Marxist economic theory. As Daniel Pulse explains in his book, in the first volume of Capital, Marx argues that human labor creates the only real value to be found in products, and that exploitation occurs when capitalists pay workers just enough to stay barely alive and then steal for themselves the remaining surplus value in the products that workers have made. I know at this point uh, some of you may feel really boring, but please bear with me, I am almost done, and I think it's really important to explain this point. Because just over a decade after Marx's death, an Austrian economist Eugen von Bawerk uh, discovered contradictions in capital. But why is all this important to us at all? As von Bawerk explains, Marx's theory of value is crucial to the related theory of surplus value, and the one cannot be given up without losing the other. The theory of surplus value is the very pivot on which Marx's central claim of worker exploitation is made to turn. Without it, his fundamentally moral complaint against capitalism seems weakened. In brief, if Marx's theory of value must be given up, it's hard to see what could remain of the rest of Marx's economic theory. The doctrine of exploitation, the thesis of class struggle, the claims about base and superstructure, and of course the theory of religion, all of these become difficult to defend. If von Bawerk is right, then Marx's theory of religion also has big problems. As Daniel Pulse explains, later Marxists have worked hard to refute this critique and revise Marx, but without notable success. And now let's conclude. Just like Durkheim and Freud, Marx also follows the path of reductionism in the matter of religion. But for him, it ends at a different destination, not with the needs of society or the neurotic personality, but with class struggle and economic alienation. Marx, like Freud, thought that he had unraveled the universal mechanism that produces all forms of religion. So he saw no need to engage in anthropology and comparative study of religion. He didn't see much difference between Christianity and religions of the indigenous Australians. Marx was confident that everywhere he would find the dynamic of class struggle. But just as Freud failed to show that all religion emerged from wish fulfillment, Marx failed to fully reveal how all religions emerge from class struggle. And while he emphasizes the enormous role of revolution, he failed to recognize that sometimes religion can also be a catalyst for revolution. Therefore, many scholars agree that Marx understood religion too simply. Sometimes, indeed, it holds back social progress, but sometimes religion can play the role of catalyst for social change. Often the charisma of religious leaders such as Luther challenge the status quo. Also, religion often helps to solve practical issues, providing not only communal and psychological support, but also material support through charity. Also, what would Marx say about individual, non-institutional, non-structural forms of spirituality that became so popular in the 20th century? In conclusion, yes, Marx made many of us look at the world with different eyes. He raised very important issues of injustice and social inequality. But he proposed two radical methods for solving these problems, and at the same time didn't always see the complexity of such phenomena as religion. My friends, I hope this review was helpful and you'll support it with like and comment. Once again, I based it mainly on this wonderful book by Daniel Pals, and I highly recommend it if you need more details. Many thanks to my patrons on Patreon, Daber and Adam, and those who support me with one-time donations through PayPal. Join them if you like what I do. From my end, I wish you peace and health wherever you are.